Okay. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us online today for the aphids in Broadacre crops and update from Pestpax Southeastern. We're Caesar Australia. We're a small independent research organisation based in Victoria. Uh, and we're really excited to be here today to give you a little bit of an update on some of the aphid research that we're doing and some management updates as well. Now, if you haven't heard of PestFacts Southeastern before, we are a program that's funded by the GRDC, and the whole idea is that we keep growers and advisors informed about invertebrate pests and beneficial insects, usually during the winter cropping season and mostly based in Victoria and southern New South Wales. We have some really fantastic partners from across the government departments, including DPIRD, SADI, QDAP and New South Wales DPI. Uh, and we run a series of workshops throughout the year to inform growers and advisors about what's going on. So why did we decide to focus on aphids today? Well, there's a lot of talk of aphids this year, and we were sitting around thinking about what the best topic would be. And we realized that correct aphid ID and management is really important for a number of reasons. And that's why we decided to focus on aphids today. There are a number of different chemicals which can be used to control aphids, but these differ, the registered chemicals differ for different species. So that's the first reason why you need to know which species you're actually dealing with. There are also some really important insecticide resistance issues in a couple of species, which we'll be talking about today. And there are differences in damage potential too. So you may have one species that isn't actually likely to cause damage in the crop that it's found in and doesn't require control. So that's worth knowing. There are a number of viruses which can be transmitted by different species of aphids uh, and there is different damage at different crop status. So there's a little bit of complexity there when it comes to aphid species. There are also over 150 species in Australia, but luckily we don't have to deal with all of them today. Um, when we're talking about broadacre crops in southern Australia, there's this breaks it down to kind of eight or nine species that we really need to be worried about. And when we're talking about identification, I just wanted to give a really quick um, kind of summary here and a reminder that when we look at a identification of aphids, the host is one of the most important features for working out which species we've got because there are specific pests which will be in each of those um, host groups uh, and that can break it down to which species you actually um, have. So when we are looking at the appearance there, just a really quick kind of overview. The siphunculi, these little kind of exhaust pipes down the end are a really important identification feature. The colder, which is the little tail down the end, the length of the antennae, and of course, all the different behavioral elements, such as how much damage they do, where they are, and things like the size and body shape. We'll talk a little bit about these when we go through the individual species today. Now, just to give you an example of why it's important to look at what crop they're in, if we have a look at cereals in particular, there's three main species which you might expect to see in cereals, Russian wheat aphid, oat aphid and corn aphid. And if you look at those three aphids, they've got very, very different um, morphological characteristics. So rather than having to worry about looking at every single aphid and worrying which species you've got, look at the crop, look at which species are within those crop, and then it becomes much easier to break down to what species you have. Now, today we're going to be focusing on these three species, the green peach aphid, the blue green aphid, and the faba bean aphid. So they're across different crops um, and these are all present in southern New South Wales and Victoria. So we have four speakers today from Caesar Australia. Um, aphid is, uh, Everett is going to be talking about blue green aphids. Stephanie is going to be talking about the faba bean aphid. Lilia about the green peach aphid. And I'm going to give you a quick update on our beneficials insecticide toxicity table. And you are able to ask questions of any of our speakers at any stage during the Q&A, and we'll have lots of time to address them towards the end. So I'll hand straight over to Evett for the first section of the webinar. Thanks, Lydia. All right, I'll share my screen. Jump on in. So... Today I'm going to be talking about a new challenge in the, the new emergence of uh, insecticide resistance in blue-green aphids. So just starting off with what are blue-green aphids, as the name suggests, that bluey-green in colour, but definitely, as you can see from the photos below, more green than blue. Um, they're widespread across Australia, um, Australian states, um, primarily a uh, pest of um, lucin, clover, pastures, and several types of grain legumes, particularly so lentils. And uh, as with most aphids, they cause damage not only via directly feeding 
um, and sort of so they're sucking pests, they suck out the nutrients from plants, but they transmit a number of viruses. In the case of blue-green aphids, it's also the number of mosaic viruses. I think alfalfa mosaic virus, cucumber mosaic virus. So these secondary effects of virus transmission can tend to be a bit more worry um, than actually the aphids themselves. And again, as with most aphids, we see the outbreaks most common in, um, in spring, and that's when uh, chemical trolls typically most needed, but also they can pop up in autumn and winter and sometimes early summer, depending on what part of the part of the world you're in and what type of crops you're growing. Now, uh, historically, blue-green aphid haven't been, I guess, the highest priority of our aphid pests. And this is primarily because historically, um, growers have been able to use these two older chemistries, older and relatively cheaper chemistries that have provided a higher level of control. And for most crop types, um, so these are organophosphates. So I think your um, purifos, your dimethoate, your methoate, and also your carbamate. So mostly uh, pyrimacarb. And for most, uh, and most crop types, these are, until recently, there are only two chemical groups registered for blue green aphids. For a long time, these have provided effective control, but in recent times, um, we've had a number of reports of control failures and in our preceding work, when we explored these control failures, we unfortunately found that uh, three populations of blue-green aphid had evolved resistance to these insecticides, meaning um, they were never, no longer providing effective control. Now, this insecticide resistance in blue green aphid was the first of its kind, not only in Australia, but also worldwide. So there's sort of, there a lot of unknowns about what's necessarily going to happen next with these uh, newly evolved aphids and how we manage this problem. So, for instance, it's a bit unclear of where they're going to spread, if there's any preference for any crop types, if there's any other um, factors that can help us manage them which uh, led us to our current work. So apparently through funding from the GRDC and AgriFutures, uh, working essentially trying to fill in some of these unknowns by helping the grains and pasture seeds industries manage these existing blue-green aphids that are insecticide resistance, and also trying to put in some plans forward to prevent any future resistance, either to new chemicals or increasing their magnitude to these existing uh, chemicals. And this project has a few different facets that I'm not going to get too much in today. We're just going to really focus on our work on the spatial variation resistance. So over the last nine months or so, we've been collecting additional populations from across, uh, mostly across Southeast Australia. We are looking further abroad um, to try and to ascertain where these resistant aphids are spreading to and um, if preferentially, if there's any crop types, that there's any, uh, any trends towards, with the sort of the end goal of us being able to provide a set of recommendations um, for different regions and different crop types, so folks can go and make the most educated decision about what's the best way to manage uh, the blue-green aphids problems in their area and for their crops. Um, so, so far, um, in this time, we've me measured 11 new blue-green aphid populations, and this is across uh, multiple states, so South Australia, New South Wales, and Victoria. Um, uh, but again, we are interested in testing um, from particularly sort of, uh, South Queensland and Western Australia and Tassie. We're keen to get in this project in the future soon. Um, we've tested across multiple crop types, um, predominantly lucerne, because this is where I guess um, so far we've been founding them, found them in a lot of recent times. And we've also brought a mix of aphids that will come from control failures. So we suspect that there's going to be resistance there, but also a few populations where we weren't from control failures. So we wanted to see just generally how far is this um, new resistant aphids, um, how far are they spreading? And we're testing their resistance to three chemicals. Um, so two, so again, these two chemicals I brought up earlier before is groups of glyphosphates and carbamates, which we have historically been the main ways of controlling blue-green aphid. Uh, 
And for each of these groups, we've just been testing one chemical, got pyrifos for organophosphates and pyrimacarb for carbonates. But based on what we know already about these aphids, we expect these results to sort of hold up against other types of organophosphates and carbonates. So again, we expect these results to represent what's happening for dimethoate and omethoate and for other types um, of organophosphates that are used. We're also testing resistance against alpha supermethrin because which isn't well, pyrethroids aren't traditionally used to control blue-green aphids in most instances. We've detected some resistance there, um, but I'm not going to get too much into that pyrethroid resistance um, today just for the interest of time. So that's what we found so far. So I'll throw a few <laughs> graphs at you now, and I'll explain what's, there, what's happening in each one uh, before going too much. So... Oops. So on the horizontal axis here, we just have our different populations. On this vertical axis here, we just have what we call our LC50 value. So it's our lethal concentration for 50. And all this means essentially the concentration of lepirifos, which kills half our aphids. Now, um, for all of these bioass, chemical bioassays that we do to test resistance, we always, well, where possible in most instances, we compare resistance against a known susceptible population. So this is sort of a population where we know lacks any chemical resistance, it essentially provides a yardstick to figure out if these new populations are showing any differences. Um, so the dots on each of these just show the average concentration where half of the aphids died for pyrifos. These uh, dots that are in blue uh, show essentially populations where we didn't find any resistance. Um, so these population out here and also here, um, we detected that it still remains susceptible and there's no shifts. But uh, unfortunately, we found so six of these 11 populations in red here showed there was significant shifts that would suggest that these uh, areas, these resistant aphids are now spread to these new areas. Um, and the magnitude of this was about sort of 10 to 40 folds, essentially needed uh, 10 to 40 or 10 to 20 fold higher levels of clopyrifos to get the basically kill these aphids than what we traditionally need. Uh, when we tested for the next chemical, chemical pyramicarb, we found a similar story. So again, these graphs are laid out basically the same as the previous slide, but it's just pyrimacarb instead of pyrifos. Uh, I'll just note there's two different graphs here just because we ran this uh, study over two batches. So, And again, when we sort of ran this similar story, we found um, the same populations that we found resistance to pyrifos tended to be resistance uh, to uh, pyrimacarb, although there was a slight more variation. And we found um, some populations here shown in yellow, which um, the results are a bit inconclusive, um, which does reflect somewhat what we've been hearing on the field is that um, the folks have been having a little bit or well, having more issues with ometh um, or kind of phosphate based products and pyrimacarb has been performing slightly better or the, although there's still been control phase, a number of control phase of pyrimacarb. So there might be something in that the, um, difference between resistance to organophosphates and pyrimacarb that we're going into. Now, just to sort of present this in a different way that it maps to sort of show where I guess these resistance are showing. Um, uh, so we have our two here, well, organophosphates and carbonates. And again, these colors, dots, um, set, represent the same colors from the previous figures. So there's a few, I guess, preliminary inferences that we're taking away um, from this work so far is that these re resistant aphids are unfortunately spreading into new areas. So initially we found just um, in South Australia, just around uh, where I'm circling region here, was where we initially detected resistance, but we can now see that resistance is not only staying stable in this area, but it's also spreading further west up to the air peninsula. We've also detected for the first time uh, resistance in Victoria, uh, just outside of uh, Bendigo. But again, this is sort of a one really detected resistance there in one site. So we're, um, we want to sort of consolidate to see what's happening here, whether this is a one-off or 
whether um, is a if it's a sort of sex. Am I going to stay around there from now on? The other sort of thing again is sort of early days in making this, but so far it seems the resistant blue green aphid ended being a bit more common in loosen crops than other crops. Um, but again, that's early early days, so before we can make any clear recommendations on that. But that's just the current trend. And another key point to sort of address some of these populations where we found a resistance came from areas where um, growers hadn't had any control issues of blue green aphid, which suggests to us that blue green aphids have just recently moved into these areas and resistance has so far gone undetected. So it's just a, a, a note that these are potentially moving to new areas. So what we can, can we do? So I'll quickly run through some recommendations as far as chemical control. Where practical, I guess, at the moment we're advising avoiding spraying blue-green aphids with organophosphates and carbonates, particularly if you're in, in these regions where we've detected insecticide resistance. And there's two reasons for this. One, we can't really guarantee these chemicals are going to provide effective control, so you might be wasting your time and money going out and using these chemicals. But also, um, continuing to spray these resistant populations with these chemicals is just going to help them spread. So essentially, by spraying these chemicals on a resistant aphids, you're killing all the competitors so they just can breed and um, if, um, attack plants without any competitors and spread faster. Uh, in its place, so sulfoxifor, which is a more recent chemistry that's quite very different to these other two chemicals where resistance picked up, um, has been re uh, is registered for, against blue-green aphid in uh, some pulses and has been recently registered in lucerne. And um, from all accounts and anecdotal accounts, it's providing a, a good level of uh, control. Uh, Flamiconid, uh, so Mayman is the product name. Um, their emergency permit was uh, provided in some uh, lucency crops during some late growth stages. So it's a, a, it is another potential chemical option, although it is quite narrow. So just making sure um, uh, when, if you're going to go to use Mayman, uh, you are sort of following those quite sort of narrow situations where it's applicable. The last point to sort of talk about these chemicals is because of these new these new chemicals transform in Mayman and newer products, they're often more expensive than the older traditional uh, organophosphates and carbamates. So there is a, always a temptation to cut rates, and we're hearing these anecdotal accounts of some folks that are cutting rates. Um, the risk always with that is sort of going off label recommendations and using these lower rates is you're going to help resistance emerge against these uh, newer chemistries and then leading to an issue of just losing efficiency. So it's, while it's sort of tempting to cut rates, it can lead to some bigger headaches down the line. Uh, some recommendations on, on biological control. We also know in a, uh, a number of uh, predators um, will attack blue-green aphids. I mean, anecdotally from group growers and agronomists that accounted control phase from insect, um, insecticides did use particularly ladybird, ladybirds and parasitoid wasps very effectively after control phase. Um, and a great way, which um, uh, Lizzie is going to go into a talk later on, is about selecting chemicals um, that are a bit softer on these beneficials. Um, can be a great first step in management. Uh, as far as cultural options, there's also outside of chemicals. Um, where possible, particularly in some medics, um, there are cultures out there that are more resistant to blue-green native feed da damage, and that's possible. Um, that's uh, a great option. Um, of course, not possible in all such pearl crops. Uh, a main one for cultural control, and this goes for a number of aphid species, is just uh, controlling weeds around crops during summer and early autumn. So during those hotter months, Aphids uh, basically survive for refuges, particularly weeds and medic weeds or volunteer um, vetch and things which are popping up. Removing these alternate hosts between growing seasons can at least delay um, the arrival of aphids. Uh, and again, um, Lizzie touched on this earlier, but identifying the same species that attack blue green, same crops as blue green aphids can be really uh, important as far as selecting what popular, knowing 
what resistances are out there, but also knowing what chemical options are available. The main one that gets confused a lot for blue-green aphid is pea aphid. They look, um, they attack the same, a lot of the same crops and they look nearly exactly the same. Pea aphid is just a bit bigger and a slightly different antenna, um, which by eye can be a bit tricky, but if you get in contact with us, we can try to help you ID things or you can refer the GIDC back pocket on aphids to try and get a sense of um, uh, ID guide to try and tell the difference between pea aphids and blue green aphids. Uh, and the last last sort of point that I'll make is this: so this project that we're running with GIDC and AgriFutures will uh, continue uh, for at least the next eighteen months, um, and we really need help sort of collecting aphids. Um, so most of these populations we tested today were, or should we show today, if were from folks that have sent in um, aphids from their crops. So going forward, we still want the more samples we, uh, we can test, the better we can find out where it's spread, what area is the most risk of resistance. If resistance is staying stable in the area or if it's just occasionally popping in and out, we do see that sometimes. Also, what crop types are at risk? We're currently seeing um, resistant populations popping up most so far in loosened crops and less in things like lentils, but we're still too early to make a really strong call on that. Um, so the more samples you can help and send it in, um, the better recommendations we can, um, the more accurate things we can put out throughout the project. And just, I guess, the last little note on this is our, our turnaround often for this stuff is about two to three months, depending on what else is happening around. But samples that are sent currently, so around May and June, so even though at the moment there's not a lot of... Uh, Outbreaks of blue green aphid, they kind of they seem to be quite low densities right now. Being able to send us in these samples now will give us the best chance of being able to turn them around and giving recommendations on um, what's popping up of there's resistance in your area by spring when these outbreaks are going to be more common and chemical interventions are going to be more likely to be acquired. Uh, yeah, uh, just yeah, I guess. Last acknowledge all this work uh, was funded through AgriFutures and GRDC and running collaboration with Lucent Australia. Um, and thanks to all the folks that have been sampled. Yeah, I think I'll pass on to the next talk. Thanks so much, Evan. We'll pass on to Lilia. And we've had a couple of great questions come through on the Q&A too. So keep those questions coming and we will address them at the end. Awesome, thank you. All right, can is that one up? Okay, beautiful. So today I will be talking to you all about uh, green pea aphid update, um, and we'll also mostly be going into resistance as well because there's a lot going on. Um, so to start off with a quick crash course um, in green pea aphids, um, they're best identified by the size of their cycles, which are those little exhaust pipe type features down the bottom. Um, so they're quite long compared to the other aphids and it's the best feature as their colour is quite variable um, and, yeah, it's just a little bit tricky otherwise. Um, but we don't also always have the time to get up and close and personal to aphids, so when that's the case, behaviour can also be a really good tell. So GPA really like their personal space. Um, they're found very sparsely across the plant and are usually found on the underside of lower leaves. But if you see a really dense colony on upper leaves, then it's more likely one of these other two aphids. So those are the best tells. And whilst canola crops are particularly susceptible, GPA are known to infest various broadacre, broadleaf and horticultural crops. And they actually have over 40 host plants. So they can be found throughout the year. Um, they have a population peak in spring and autumn. And that's when they migrate into newly sown crops from remnant weeds or volunteer crop plants. And these are called green bridges. So that means that we're basically entering the risk season now. So because GBA are sap suckers, heavier infestations can be a real risk in the early stages of crops. And this can lead to issues such as leaf distortion, leaf senescence, and in severe cases, seedling death. It's also a really notorious disease vector and can transmit more than 100 plant viruses, and this includes the turnip yellows virus. 
So this virus, which causes that red discoloration you see in the photo there, it's a really major concern as it can cause significant yield reductions, ranging from anywhere from 10 to 80%, and there's currently no treatment or cure available. So insecticides have been the conventional approach, just like in BGA, for protecting our grain crops against these pests. And there's a few different insecticidal groups that have been registered for GPA in Broadacre. But the majority of use comes from the four main ones you see here, which are carbamates, organophosphates, pyrethroids, and neonicotinoids. But the question is if these are still effective in everything that's going on in our landscape now. So with carbamates, we have seen a really widespread target site resistance evolve. And that means that field rates no longer control any resistant populations. And what's worrying is that we're seeing this resistance really spread out um, in nearly all states compared to 2013. So you can see the spread in these two maps here. We also see really widespread resistance to pyrethroids, which again means that field rates don't control the resistant populations. And again, we've got a really dramatic spread from 2013. So that's only 10 years. And you can see how far out it's actually spread in nearly all states. With organophosphates, the level of resistance is a little bit lower, so they can still be used to sort of control them, but it's a real risk because the resistance can actually be switched on in response to stresses. So it's still really inherently risky and it's sort of still best to avoid it. And again, you can see that the resistance is really spreading, especially in WA and along the coast of Victoria. Again, with neonicotinoids, um, the level of resistance is quite low, especially compared to overseas populations. So Australian GPA populations have um, five to 25 times more resistance to neonicotinoids, whilst overseas populations are more like a thousand times resistant. But, um, and it's also a newer resistance, so the spread hasn't, it's not as dramatic yet but there is a real worry when it comes to seed treatments. So obviously Australia relies really heavily on seed treatments to protect our early stage crops. Like I said, GPA can be a real risk to them. Um, and we sort of treat them as an insurance policy at the moment. Um, they also play a really significant role in integrated pest management because they can reduce the need for foliar insecticide sprays later in the season. Initially, it was believed that when following recommended field rates for seed treatments, they would still be effective against neonicotinoid resistant populations. However, in a recent study led by Caesar Australia, where we tested three aphid populations, including two resistant ones, the seed treatments actually only provided partial or no control. And this may mean that that resistance can result in field control failures and potentially a higher risk of early aphid establishment and virus spread and all of those other bad things we want to avoid. So what does this all actually mean for chemical control of GPA? We've got the good, the bad, and the bugly, essentially. So whilst the emergence of resistance in GPA has rendered carbamate and pyrethroid insecticides ineffective against resistant populations, sulfoxiflor is still effective, um, although susceptibility shifts have now been noted outside of the original detection zone um, in WA. So resistance to this is starting to spread. Um, so whilst they are still really effective, we just have to be cautious and strategic when using them to prevent any further sensitivity shift and make sure we're maintaining this efficacy. We also have confirmed that Australian GPA um, don't, don't display resistance to the chemicals flunicamid or adipiporopin. Um, and furthermore, both of these products are unique in the way that they work and they're known to be soft on natural enemies. So that makes them a really good addition to any integrated pest management or any pesticide rotations. Um, but we can no longer really take control for granted when we're using these chemicals and attempt to control GPA, especially when using neonicotinoid based seed treatments in controller could become more difficult. And this points to the value of monitoring and starting to use more integrated pest management to stay on top of those numbers before, during and um, in early crop establishment periods. So you can implement cultural control methods to control both your GPA and your TUYB risks. So this includes reducing the green bridge um, with a focus on TUYB hosts, which includes brassica plants like your shepherd's purse, your 
um, wild radish because they tend to host the virus a lot more. You can also sow directly into standing stubble and this reduces your GPA risk by minimising the bare ground, which acts as a visual cues for the aphids when they're migrating. And again, always making sure that you're monitoring for aphids um, throughout the cropping season and that you're properly identifying GPA to ensure that your chemical control is as effective as you want it to be. But when making those chemical decisions, always keep resistance in mind. It should really only be used as a last resort after pest monitoring and make sure that you're rotating between all your chemical groups and where possible, try to avoid the consecutive use of seed treatments. Though we recognise that's difficult at the moment because just about all seeds come treated. And lastly, it's also avoid, advised to avoid the use of those broad, broad spectrum insecticides. Um, not only do we have a lot of resistance to them, but you can encourage your beneficial insects by choosing softer, more selective ones. And you do have a lot of allies out there. So you have the ladybird beetles, hoverflies. So those are your tough little generalists. So they'll contribute to all aspects of pest control. But then you also have your specialists like your parasitoid wasps. So they're active all year round and they provide a lot of control um, with one wasp predating on above 300 aphids. The only thing to really note is that there might be like a two to three day um, lag behind the aphids just because they need time to find them, they need time to breed up as well. So, you know, just be sure that you're giving them the time to act before you're stepping in. And then finally, again, if you do have any suspected resistance, you can get in contact with Caesar Australia for resistance testing. So like with the BGA, we will provide you with your results in two to three months. Um, and you can then use that to help inform future management decisions. And you'll also be helping us to understand the spread of resistance. So it's a really great thing to do. And we're looking for them in a range of crops, not just broadacre and especially in Tassie. So yeah, finally, just a quick acknowledgement that this is a DRDC investment and we also do a lot of work with the Western Australia Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development and we have additional funding um, by in-kind contributions. So yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lilia. Um, keep those questions coming in. We'll get to them at the end and I'll hand over to Steph. Thanks, Lizzie. I'll share my screen and get started. Great. Awesome. So, uh, Farber bean aphid, what we know so far, and 2023 surveillance efforts. Um, this is a fairly new, I guess, pest incursion into Australia, and it's important to keep on top of. <clears throat> so, Magura crassicauda is the Latin name of this pest, though it has been referred to in the literature as other names, um, particularly as it's uh, native to um the eastern, I guess, parts of the world. Uh, it was first observed in metropolitan Sydney in October of 2016. Um, it moved on to farber bean trial sites in Tamworth and Breeza, again in New South Wales, um, and it's now become established in New South Wales and spreading through Victoria. It tends to form large colonies on leaves, stems and pods, and it prefers farber bean and vet hosts, though it does also um, persevere on other pulses. So this year we're looking into the current and potential range of where the fiber bean aphid is, their damage risk and management options. So some identification tips, I guess, to build on what Lizzie started us off with at the beginning of this webinar. Um, for fiber bean aphid specifically, they're quite a large aphid. Um, wingless adults are between 3 and 3.7 millimetres in body length. They're broadly spindle-shaped. They've got these red eyes, which are fairly notable features seen here. Um, they're green with a black head, prothorax, legs, siphunculi, and a cauda. Um, other notable features that should be kept aware of, that you should keep aware of, are that their anten antennae tend to be as long as or longer than their body. Um, they have two dark lines on the seventh and eighth abdominal segments, and they have small dark plates where 
the siphunculite draw it, join the body. Um, winged adults are larger, um, are darker, and newly, had, uh, newly hatched nymphs, sorry, appear lighter in colour. Um, yes, so their host range, they tend to feed on the Vichia genus of plants. They do prefer fava beans and vetches, um, as well as broad beans. Uh, that includes native vetches and veg volunteer weeds. Um, though there has been some research into their incidence on field pea, lentil, lucerne, and sub clover, uh, which can all aid in the survival and reproduction of this pest, though lucerne and sub clover are to a lesser extent um, conducive to that. And you can see here um, how densely that they tend to cluster on their hosts. So crop damage, they do quickly form hotspots in crops um, and symptoms of this include necrosis, wilting, stunting and defoliation. You can see here a photo by Yuk Van Leer in the New South Wales DPI, just how stark that difference is with its neighbouring plants. Um, FBA is a vector for bean leaf roll mosaic virus and PC borne mosaic virus as well. Um, we don't know what else it is a vector for, but we are looking to an understanding of that as well. So predictions for distribution in the southeast. Uh, Vetchweeds will be problematic green bridges, so it's important to stay on top of that in the coming seasons. Um, five bean aphid is likely to encompass regions four and five of pulse production by rainfall and climate, so medium high rainfall, um, Mediterranean temperate climate, and then low medium rainfall temperate and climate. Um, the distribution spread is likely to be facilitated by metropolitan parks and gardens based off trends that we've already seen. Um, reports on citizen science platform My Naturalist. I have seen lots of um, suburban backyards and gardens um, being, I guess, breeding grounds for this pest. Um, and just this month in New South Wales, Fabian aphid has been found in large numbers in a broad bean crop in Laguna. Uh, due to the colder climate of Victoria and the southeastern region, the likelihood to cause damage and persevere is yet to be determined, but it is something that we're looking into um, in the coming months. And that comes to our research plan. So the GRDC is thankfully investing in this project so that we can get an understanding of the current distribution and their potential range for this pest, um, the reproduction and life cycle of this pest in our Southern Australia context is largely unknown. And we need to get a better understanding of their ability to survive in cold environments. Um, Fab bean aphids produced from either sexual or asexual reproduction have shown poor survival rates in extremely cold environments with some research coming out of Asia. Um, but we need to understand this in a South Australian context better before we feel comforted by that. Um, we are looking into viable natural enemies as well. So there has been overseas success with ladybird beetles and predatory mites, and there are possible local parasitoids, um, which we will be collecting and rearing in the lab so that we can get a better understanding of again. Um, we do also need to look into IPM compatible chemical options as alternatives to SPs and OPs. Um, just due to the general I guess, state of affairs of how those chemistries are treating our um, farm ecosystems. So our fieldwork plan in 2023 um, will involve a great deal of surveillance. So we'll be undertaking surveys in Victoria and Southern New South Wales and a bit of um, Eastern South Australia uh, at crop establishment. So in around May, June, um, September, October, and then in summer around January, we'll be spending a, month, a number of days in each of these regions in each of the seasons um, to try and get a good sample size to bring back to the lab and rear. Um, from there, we'll be recording crop colonization behavior and we'll be looking for any beneficials and other insects present while we are collecting the fiber bean aphids. Um, we are targeting different rainfall zones, which is important because it has been shown to drastically 
affect the pest biology and parasitoid numbers, as well as other species present. Um, so we will be collecting samples for bioassets and parasitoid rearing, though we would like uh, you to keep an eye out as well. And if you see anything that you think might be good, please send in specimens, identify them. Again, two to three month turnaround time, but we will be including them in our parasitoid studies. Uh, acknowledgements. Okay, so I'd firstly like to thank the research Eric and the New South Wales DPI for their extensive contributions to the knowledge of this pest in the New South Wales context. Um, this research is part of a GRDC investment, um, which we are grateful to be a part of. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Steph. And we're on to the last section for today, which is me. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the updated beneficial toxicity table, which is um, um, one of a management support that we've been producing through CESA and our partners over the last couple of years. Um, so knowledge is power when it comes to IPM. And we know that there are a huge range of really useful beneficial insects in our ecosystems, which can help. But sometimes it's really hard to actually work out how to support them within the current management systems that we have. So we can improve the IPM strategies that we have by choosing chemicals which have a lower off-target impact. Um, there's been really good support for this kind of work in horticulture and cotton over the last couple of years. Cotton have had a really good toxicity table for years and hort have got some good support there as well. But previously in grains, we were a little bit behind the eight ball as far as we weren't sure what kind of impacts the chemicals we were using in the contexts in which we were using them would have on our beneficials. Um, but we now have been developing the support for grains. So this is our beneficials toxicity table. Hopefully you've seen it before. It's been out for about a year now, but we just recently updated this. So there's new updated information that's just come out today. Um, if you haven't seen this table before, basically what we have is a range of different beneficial groups across the top. We have that active ingredients down the side. And then the, the table shows, it brings together a whole lot of information which is in the background, which is from both literature reviews internationally and in Australia, and a whole lot of um, laboratory work that's been done by CESA Australia and others. And it gives you an overall rating of how toxic that particular chemical will be for that group. So it's the mortality. So if it's a low mortality, you've got this green, um, and if it's high, you know, the red color. Um, so this can help with if you're targeting specific um, beneficial groups to know which kind of chemicals are going to affect them. And the newer version of this has just been uploaded to our website. You can find it under the resources tab. So what we did find just generally from this work was that most of these kind of soft chemicals did have low mortality rates. So this is a bit of a relief. You know, the, the, tech, the um, common ones like flanicamid and aphidopyrophan, they really are going to be reasonably soft on most of the beneficial insects we have out there. That's good news. We also found that there are particular groups of beneficial insects which are broadly quite tolerant. So things like rove beetles and hoverflies, anything on the kind of lower end of the spectrum with these, um, these chemicals is going to be reasonably safe for these kind of, um, these kind of groups. So if you are always erring towards using the more selective chemicals, you're supporting these species, you know, straight off. You know, don't even have to think about it. But also just kind of keeping in consideration that these were all laboratory-based trials at the moment. So we're just looking at mortality in the lab. Toxicity in the field will be different to what it is in the lab. And we do have to take into effect things like sublethal effects. So even sometimes if a chemical doesn't kill a beneficial insect outright, it might lower the activity that it has in the field. Um, but that's, that's kind of the next step of the research. And at least here, we've got a broad idea of the kind of impacts that the chemicals will have. If we think about aphids and how we might use this table to support aphid management, conventional management uses a whole range of insecticides, which we've talked about today in the context of resistance and management. Um, but as we've also spoken about, there are a range of beneficial insects which can actually keep a lot of aphids below thresholds just by having them in our fields, um, including a whole range of parasitoids, ladybirds and lacewings. Now, pyrimacarb was often thought to be a softer option for S compared to SPs and OPs. 
But unfortunately, what we found with this table is that this soft option actually has a really high impact on the egg parasitoids, which are attacking aphids. So these parasitoids come in, they lay in the eggs and they stop the aphids from developing and attacking crops. Um, if you're using pyramicarb, it has a really high impact on these egg parasitoids and also a medium impact on predatory bugs and um, lepidoptrin parasitoids and predatory mites. So it's it still is pretty soft as far as hoverflies, ladybirds and rove beetles go, but it does have that high impact there. Thankfully, what we did find was, was that for those chemicals we've been talking about before, flunimicamid and aphidopyrofen, they are much softer on the egg parasitoids. So flunicamid is still a little bit of a problem there, but at least it is going to let some survive. But those two options there are going to be a better option for the management of aphids because they will allow those parasitoids to survive and support the management of aphids within your crops. So just very broadly to finish off, using this table for management, it's there so that you can support the, the support these beneficials within your crops wherever possible. Um, you can, it has to be used alongside monitoring if you want to actually identify specific beneficial species. So this is making chemical choices for specific pests. If you've got a lot of aphids, you want to really be focusing on those aphid parasitoids. But it can also be used for general kind of overall chemical choices. So if you don't know exactly which beneficials are in your crops or you don't have an idea of what pests are going to be there, you can have a look at which of those chemicals has the least overall effect and, and select according to that. So this table was put together as part of our AgPIP project, uh, which is a collaboration between CESA and the University of Melbourne. There's a whole lot of research that's gone behind this huge amount of research over the many years and many researchers we'd like to thank and of course the GIDC for supporting this research as well. Now, just to finish off, there is quite a bit of support around aphid and pest management within grains that we can offer. So Pestback Southeastern provides free IDs for any grain pests. You can contact us at any time. We love getting reports and ID requests. Um, these can either be images or samples. Images is always a good first start, but if we can't identify it from an image, we'll get you to send in a sample. You can text it through to us, you can email to us, you can even send it through to us on Twitter and we'll get back to you. We've also got a new Pest Facts Reporter app, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but as Evett and Lilia alluded to before, we also have free resistance testing for blue green aphid, green peach aphid and the red legged earth mite. And I'll tell you in a second how you can send those samples into us. Um, so this we're quite excited about. This is the new Pest Facts Southeastern Reporter app. So this is a really quick and easy way for you to send in samples to us. Um, you can download the app on Google Play or Android and those um, reports come straight into the map so that we can actually track what pests are out there and can give you the best advice possible over time. And we are after a whole lot of samples. So everything that we've talked about today has really relied on getting samples from you guys, from getting stuff coming in from the field so that we've got a good idea where these species are, but as Everett was saying, you know, we really need to understand where the resistance is um, if we want to be able to keep on top of this and give the best information possible. We're also doing really cutting edge research on pest management in aphids, which requires a range of different aphid species. So basically, if you come across an aphid in the field this year, we probably want it. Um, and we would, it's, it really, really supports the research we do. So if you do have samples you can send into us, um, the best way to do it is to get kind of a hard um, Tupperware container, pop the paper towel in there so they don't get too sweaty, put a little bit of the host plant so that they can feed on it. Everett was telling me that we've had a lot with the stuff full of, of too much host material and that they kind of suffocate. But so a little bit of that host material and then send it in to us. And you can email us at um, info at Caesar Australia if you want any more information and we will make sure that the samples come to the right place and that you um, get in contact with the researcher that's doing the relevant um, work. So that's the end of the content for today. We do have some great questions that we can get started on um, and do feel free to add more of those in. Um, I will get started on a question that came through earlier, which I might hand over to Stephanie, which was about what kind of um, management options we actually have for fiber green aphid, because it's such a new, um, kind of pest in Victoria, especially, what can we be doing about it? The answer about management options, uh, as far as 
chemical actives go? Not a lot. So the only um, active registered the um, control of fava bean aphid in fava beans is pymetrazine uh, via an emergency use permit that's just been extended to 2026. Um, but for veggies and broad beans, nothing as of yet. So my answer to that, I guess, is just the standard cultural and biological management options. Keep on top of monitoring. Make sure that you're IDing correctly so that you're not spraying for the wrong thing or the wrong reason. Um, and, yeah, there are some efficacy trials being conducted at the moment for uh, imidacloprid and perimicarb, which are looking promising, but nothing concrete as of yet. So if you do suspect that you have fabin aphid, um, please forward us a sample or even let us know where maybe we should be conducting some surveys to collect some samples ourselves. Fantastic. Yes. Um, I'm also seeing in the chat, there's quite a few questions about um, versus and the use of a phytopyrophan for aphids as well. Lilia spoke about that a little bit in her section, but um, Evert, is there anything you wanted to add there as far as that, that use of that particular chemical? Uh, nothing, yeah, nothing beyond that. I just, I guess, refer to the table you um, popped on earlier, Lizzie, I think. So far from the beneficial tests, it's pretty soft on most beneficials. I think one of the notable exceptions, at least for aphid predators, was in late, some ladybird uh, beetles showed some sensitivity, but parasoid wasps um, and lace wings and things, other sort of predators can be quite, uh, seem to be quite soft on those. So yeah, I think that's the only, only thing to add, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, there's a question from David about managing turnip yellows with grazing. Lilia, do you know anything about grazing as a, a method for green peach aphid? Um, I've not heard it a lot besides I know that obviously some aphids can have a, an, like a negative effect on livestock, especially um, the pea aphid, cow pea aphid, I think okay. it is. Yeah, so I'm not sure how advisable grazing would actually be in that sense, but obviously you can graze on a lot of brassicas as well. So I guess it would depend on what sort of grazing rotation system you have set up. Yeah, for most for most aphids, it's pretty it's a pretty good management strategy just put the livestock out there to eat them. If, um, but yeah, cowpea aphids the only one where we've had issues with um, consumption, which I think was one of the questions as well earlier. Yeah. Yeah, because we definitely did see that um, happening with cowpea aphid in central New South Wales last year. And actually the local land services put out some really good information around that photosensitivity and what they experienced with cowpea aphid last year as well, if you want to chase those up. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I guess currently in that, still still a lot of unknown about what's necessarily happening there. I think they've identified a potential mechanism. Um but I think we're still a little bit unsure of whether it's direct consumption of aphids or if there's any other secondary things happening of aphids interacting with plants. It's still a bit, still a lot of active research area. But yeah, I'm not quite sure where what more to add on that. Um, yeah. Um, there was another question that came in in relation to the table of whether we were going to be including bees in our insecticide use. Um, for broad acre crops. Um, pollinators haven't been the focus of the toxicity table at this stage. It's mostly predators and parasitoids. Um, but in the future, it would be good to have the knowledge about how pollinators would be affected by these chemicals as well. There is always the information that's kind of come through cotton and some hort. So they've done a lot of that background information, but again, how it will apply in grains and um, the specific environments in which we're using them is always going to be unique. That's why it's worth having a different table for the different um, industries. Right. Just to add quickly about our, to go back to our first question about um, control options, I need to amend that pymetrazine is uh, valid. The emergency use permit is only valid um, in essentially every state and territory except for Victoria. So I uh, thought that was important to, yeah. Just note. Awesome. Thank you, Steph. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about um, that fava bean aphid work as, as we get that surveillance out there and as we get a better idea about what it's actually going to be doing in, um, in Victoria. There'll be new stuff coming out this year. 
Okay, we've come to the end of our time. So we're going to wrap that up. Thank you very much for everyone attending today. And don't forget, you can always reach out to us um, at info at caesaraustralia.com and we can answer any more of your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you.